you can advertise car wrecks all day long. You know, I do car wrecks, I do car wrecks, but that doesn't equate to catastrophic injuries. That doesn't equate to, you know, serious accidents. That's Harlan Schillinger, the legal industry veteran who many regard as the black swan of legal marketing. And if you're going to talk about, well, you know, I'm the car wreck guy in a wreck, you call me. That's a brand, but that's a Walmart brand to me. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp Video, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Harlan Schillinger to discuss the past, present, and future of the legal industry, why every law firm already has a brand, be it by default or by design, and the difference between the law firms who can weather any storm and those being left in the dust. But I put my money where my mouth is, and... I really dug in, dug in deep, 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 deep. I wouldn't take a client on unless I could record their calls. I had to express to them what they didn't see, which led me to trademarking what you don't know, you don't know. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Harlan Schillinger has been on the forefront of legal advertising, intake, and conversion for over four decades. Needless to say, he's seen a few things. But has he ever seen anything like what we're going through now with COVID-19? First of all, in the legal industry, it's unprecedented times because we've never seen what we're seeing in the country. And I think that really, you know, sets the tone for where we're at. That's a statement that everybody says, well, we're in uncertain times. We all got to get together. The truth of the matter is, is that it's confusing times because of the information that's floating around. I'm not going to get political. I'm not going to get into an opinion as to whether this is true or this is not, we don't know if we should wear masks, not wear masks. Should we be with people? Not with people. Are the numbers correct? Are the, you know, the death rates attributed to COVID? So all of these issues, all of this conversation is constant banter and speculation. It's speculation based on what the CBC says today or what the local governor says today. But the problem we're having is that it's confusing. That's the unrest in the marketplace. Absolutely. And you know, when you have uncertainty as a leader, and on top of that, your team has uncertainty, your clients have uncertainty, whatever happens, let's say that could change on a day-to-day basis or even on a week-to-week basis. What does a firm owner do? What does a leader do? What is the right way to respond? And what do you take of this? Well, I'm taking the approach and with my clients, I'm suggesting that we all stay calm, which is easy to say, right? But we use common sense. We have to evaluate the market on a day-to-day basis. What we do know is that traffic is down, so accidents are going to be down. What we do know is that we're getting confusing information. So let's, let's really deal with what we do know and what we shouldn't do. And that's how I really try to break all that down. But common sense and common sense really falls into marketing because all of this has to do with marketing, has to do with how you bring your your staff back into the office. Obviously, we're in unprecedented times, but common sense will rule. Now, you, you know, you, you're obviously you're working with a number of firms in terms of how you're advising them. And there's some very, very successful firms. What's been the advice that you've been giving to them right now? Well, number one, focus on their business, focus absolutely on their business. To say focus on your business is an understatement. What does that mean? That means deal with upgrading, looking at, understanding your processes. But getting back into cash flow, focus on settling cases in the most productive, absolute manner. Don't give up on cases. Don't give in on cases, uh, you know, for quick settlements. Be very vigilant. And at the same time, pay particular attention to what intake is coming in. I would say most firms that are about 80 to 90% back on their intake. Certainly my clients are about 90% right now. I'm sure one of them or two of them are listening and they say, well, you know, I'm really at 80%, but come on, give me a little bit of slack here. I'm making a statement. The bottom line is we're not at 50%. 
And we've got to use common sense in how we sign people up and how we are marketing our firm right now. And I really think that's what the differentiation point is. The way law firm owners respond in uncertain times can have huge implications. Having experienced decades of ups and downs in the legal industry, what type of response does Harlan suggest? I think that it's a well-established fact that some of the greatest growth uh, happens in tough times during the Depression. I mean, you have a firm like Johnson & Johnson made leaps and bounds over their competitors because they took advantage of, you know, of, of, a strong, of their, their cash flow. They took advantage of, you know, just thinking in a much clearer way and not in a panicky way. And I think that exists right now. I mean, this is really is a tremendous time to evaluate what you're doing. If you panic, you're going to just get a panic result. Now the question is, okay, so what are we really talking about? How do you work on your business? I'm a firm believer of really evaluating your process. Look at your process. You're a process guy. You run your business with a process. Your process gives you a much better outcome. And I think you look at your processes, look at your you know, your case management process, look at your intake and conversion process, you know, your marketing process. As you know, I'm very passionate about intake and conversion. And I believe that is a marketing objective, though. And I look at it as a marketing tool. And it's a humbling time. Not seeing cases come in causes unrest, causes panic. It's easy for us to say, well, don't panic, spend more money, you know, all of that. But the truth of the matter is, these are not hollow words. These, we're following successful other businesses. It's interesting because where I've seen a lot of challenges just really across all business leaders is the, the ones that experience the most stress and anxiety are the ones that are resisting what is happening. So it's like they're almost like they're trying to cling on back to, you know, four or five months ago, how things were prior to an event like this, because what they're having to do day to day, how they're approaching things now has to be different. I think there's that, that resistance to the reality of things. And once somebody accepts that, now they can approach things of like, okay, here's what we can do. Here's where the opportunities are. But if someone says, hey, you know, my intakes are down because there's less vehicles on the road. I mean, that yeah, at some point you have to accept that as a reality. It is a reality. And so what do you do with the time that you would normally be spending, you know, signing up cases? Uh, you have to have the guts and the fortitude to say, I am going to fill my time with something that's going to be very productive. That's going to help my business down the road, which is communicating with your clients. I firmly believe that. You know, you're you're absolutely right. You know, people when they panic, they they don't make good decisions. The biggest pat on everybody's back was, well, we moved all of our people to remote locations. Okay, well that that was a very 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 challenging and very big move. But what comes out of that? You know, is it your acceptance of more technology, your flexibility to be able to do that? Well, you've got another challenge, moving them back into the building. And do you carry the communication skills that you professed you should be doing in the downtime that they had into incorporating it into your normal flow of business once everything does get back? Or even now at 80 percent, that's back. And so you really got to you got to have a plan. And the plan isn't in your head. The plan is on paper. The plan is put together in your office with people that will execute the plan, make them part of the solution, not throw it at somebody and say, let's do this and let's do that. Pull your team together, pull your key people together, have them come up with what needs to be done. And it'll take a lot of stress off of you. But most importantly, I believe you'll get to move the issues down the road much better. You're not going to ever win a Super Bowl unless you have a great team and they all have to work together. You've heard me talk about that many, many, many times. You got to have all the right players in place to win. You and I have talked about this you know, in years past, but to a degree, one could say that many firms have, have been spoiled almost by these periods of prosperity where you did not have to, let's say, run a, you know, a very tight business, a tight operation, great intake, you know, great culture that you could even in spite of those things still succeed you know, whether it's in personal injury, criminal defense, or another practice area, just, you know, given the, given the state of the industry. But now it seems like, you know, the importance of running a firm like a business is more important than it's ever been. Well, it's paramount. I remember when we started the National Tri Lawyers, it, we wanted to fill a void because we recognized that running a law firm is business. It's the business of law. And uh, 
I, you know, quoted my my dear friend Howard Nations, who's a phenomenal lawyer, or John Romano or Keith Givens, and they they understand how to practice law. But if they didn't have good business practices, they would not be in business today. And and uh, you know, they're tremendous mentors. You know, you got phenomenal lawyers. You take a Mark Lanier, who he had on on your podcast, but he he does run a business, and it's what's running the how you run the business will keep you in business. It's not times of prosperity, but rather times of crisis that shows who we really are. I wanted to know what Harlan would consider the biggest difference makers for law firm owners going through challenging times, particularly when it comes to short-term versus long-term thinking. There's a term in our, our business that's called working in your business or working on your business. And if you're not working on your business, you're a slave to your business and you're in a hole and you're continuing to dig. And uh, you may be earning a phenomenal living, but it's not going to take you to where you want to be or where you think you want to be in three years. It's lack of planning, the lack of a strategic plan. That's a big word, strategic plan. You could put that on a napkin and fulfill it. You'd be surprised. So few law firms have plans. They have ideas, but they don't have strategic plans in place. You know, the, one of the biggest things that, you know, that happened is people got thrown into a, a remote situation. If you think about all the firms that are out there that, you know, they think that they had it all buttoned up. They think they had the communication. They think because they can answer their telephones remotely, they've got it together. But one of the biggest tizzies that took place was communication amongst people. You know, they didn't have those processes in place. They didn't have software in place to help them manage their intake and conversion. Or they didn't, they weren't really buttoned up with, you know, their case management systems. You know, it's really funny about case management. I've learned this over the years, and you can challenge me if you'd like, but almost all the firms that have case management systems, you know, they only use 25 to 35% of, of the capabilities of them. That's staggering, but that's a fact. They don't use even half of it. That's a fact. Think about that. Think about the tools that are in place to communicate with your people much better, as well as your clients you already have in front of you. People were caught with their pants down with this working at home because there was a lack of communication between employees. They either had to call or email. They can't knock on somebody's door. There's no camaraderie. They got caught with their pants down. I, I shouldn't say that on a business conversation. I'm using that, you know, figuratively, of course. That's an old school term and I'm an old school guy. <laughs> so on that note, you retired Several years ago, I think it was what, 2016, and I, I've, I've joked with you that you are the, the the busiest retired person that I know, period. And it seems like you've been busier than ever during a time like this. Why, why do you feel that is? Well, first of all, I didn't retire. I, I orchestrated my retirement with my associates at my agency because I felt that was the proper thing to do. I was retired for about 30 seconds, literally. I am as busy now as I have ever been. I'm just doing some different things. I do not miss the agency. I don't miss people sitting in, in front of me telling me, can I tell you the truth or coming in without a solution or what have you. So I just switch gears. So let's get that off the table. I quit. I didn't retire. And in fact, a funny thing happened. I took on a client, which is my one of my agency's old biggest clients. And uh, he had to send him an email and said, I'm working with Harlan, whatever he says goes. And I would love to be in a fly on the wall. But I have to tell you, my old agency is doing a phenomenal job with this client and certainly working with me in a most phenomenal way. So it's a win, 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 win situation. To get back to your question, I work with, with seven or eight you know, private clients. I'm a strategist. I keep them out of trouble. I help them with their vendors. I help them with every single situation that comes up that needs a second opinion, which is just about everything. And I'm thriving and my clients are thriving you know, based on that relationship. I am not married to a vendor. I'm married to my client. Do I know the vendor world? Absolutely. Can I talk their language? Apparently I can. And so that's the role that I'm I'm filling. And I encourage other people, you know, it's a wide open opportunity to take that kind of an advisory position with people. In, we couldn't do a podcast, Harlan, you and I, without talking about brand and the importance of branding. And I don't just mean from the standpoint of marketing and the, you know, the assets and the collateral. I, you know, we're really talking about like the reputation of a firm, the reputation in, in their community, the reputation within their own organization and the importance of not just maintaining that, but actually improving that based on how a firm responds during a time of crisis. What, what are your thoughts just overall and just branding? Well, 
first of all, branding is what people think of you when you're out of the room. That's character. Character is what people think of you when you're out of the room. If you think of it in any other terms, you're not thinking straight. Brand is what people, what pops into your mind, what you immediately have an identification to when a TV commercial or the name comes up or I need a, you know, something. It's, it's how you feel about that, making that call to that firm. I know it brought us together. My, I recognize that you understood what brand was and you also knew how to express the brand. That's what brought us together with your business. I don't want to spend too much time giving you too many accolades. I can't give you enough accolades for what you've done in the industry and how you've been able to grasp the brand and uh, build your business, but more importantly, build other people's businesses based on brand. But brand is so, so important. Uh, you can sell a brand. It's what you stand for. It's the most recognizable feature. It's not a logo. It's not a saying. It's a culture. And that culture has to be distributed throughout media in a very unique way. You have to have the right culture. And that culture has to, it has to smell like cheese, not in a good way. I mean, you can smell that culture coming down, down the road for it to stick. I've always said that, you know, brands exist, like your business has a brand, whether it's by default or by design is, you know, perhaps a different matter. But if we work with firms all across the nation, and I was paying attention, I was looking at, okay, what are the most successful firms? And it wasn't even always the biggest advertisers, literally, what are the most successful firms, the ones that are the most profitable, the ones that are most just well-regarded in their communities, that have the best teams, the best organizations, and they always had a distinct brand. And the ones that seemed to very much struggle, it wasn't necessarily that they, from a marketing or advertising standpoint, based on how much they were spending. Spending, a lot of times it's just based on the fact that they had no identity, that their market could not see them any different than, than simply a commodity, a law firm, right? That they couldn't even tell them apart. Well, the identity that has to be detected, what, what a consumer has to understand very, very quickly about a brand is the credibility of the brand. They have to feel the credibility when they recognize the brand. And credibility is everything. You can advertise car wrecks all day long. And, you know, I do car wrecks, I do car wrecks, but that doesn't equate to catastrophic industry injuries. That doesn't equate to, you know, serious accidents. And, and if you're going to, you know, talk about, well, you know, I'm the car wreck guy in, in a wreck, you call me, that's a brand, but that's a Walmart brand to me. And by the way, Walmart's one of the most successful businesses in the world. So there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to try to attract substantial cases, everybody wants the serious case. You have to have that credibility to be able to attract people, and they have to recognize it very quickly, within seconds, that it's a credible situation. It's a credible company. It's, you know, you spot that shiny object down and you say, is it credible or is I just being blinded by the shininess? Does that make sense, Michael? So it makes sense to me, but because I know there's going to be somebody who's listening to this right now and is saying, you know, uh, Mike and Harlan are having this great conversation and they're, you know, it seems like they're, they're enjoying it, but what can I do specifically? Like what would be some of the strategies you would recommend that someone can do like a tactical approach if they wanted to improve their brand? Well, your tactical approach begins with culture and that's, that's an open question. Well, what is culture? Culture is everything that happens in your firm. The most immediate person to answer a telephone call, which I have trademarked the ambassador of first impressions, is the lowest paid employee on your staff and probably the one that gets tossed around the most, which is your receptionist. It all begins there. It's the dedication that that individual has to the sympathy of the client calling in. Now, that is a recognizable brand and an initiative that you have to embrace. Now, I've, I've really never met a lawyer that said their office wasn't compassionate and their, their receptionist isn't, or their intake people aren't the best. But if you start recording your telephone calls, you'll very quickly see that that is missing. And I am very adamant about that. You can't just say, well, how are you feeling? You have to mean it. And that culture in a personal injury firm or a, a firm that handles divorce or handles any problem that's coming at you has to be the core of your brand. It's compassion. You can't just say, well, we're compassionate. You have to act it, speak it, and you also have to have tools in place that reinforce it. 
that would be where I would start. And I would also encourage even the most seasoned advertiser, particularly the most seasoned guys, to reevaluate that. Because, listen, I've been in this business for 42 years. That's a long, long time. I can tell you what not to do. I call them the fat cats. I love the fat cats because I grew up with all the fat cats, the bigger advertisers. But believe me, your organization is not as compassionate as you think it is. I wholeheartedly agree with Harlan's point about firm culture. If you've got the right people in the right seats and in alignment with your firm's vision and mission, you can solve virtually every problem holding your organization back. But what if you're convinced that it's not culture that's holding your firm back, but rather a shortage of leads? It's interesting. About 15 years ago, clients came to me and said, give me more leads. And I said, well, what did you do with the last ones? Well, they weren't any good. And I started to really scratch my head. And things were getting very, very competitive. I had competitors that were popping up daily on the agency scene and what have you. And at that point, I said, you know something? I think I'm going to listen and pay attention to this. And I started recording telephone calls. I approached my clients and every single one of them, I honest to goodness, I could give you the names, but I don't want to embarrass anybody, said, I get everything, 94% of everything I want. And I started to really dig into that because I was very upset that I wasn't satisfying them. I wasn't giving them enough leads. But what I quickly understood is how we go through leads and how we don't farm leads and how we, we lose business. Lawyers absolutely count what's in front of them. You know, very, uh, you know, which led me to, to develop the software lead docket, which is considered one of the pros, you know, prime pieces of uh, equipment in the software in the intake and conversion business. But I put my ma- money where my mouth is and I really dug in, dug in deep, 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 deep. I wouldn't take a client on unless I could record their calls. I had to express to them what they didn't see which led me to trademarking what you don't know, you don't know. And on the intake and conversion side or the marketing side, you can supply a firm with all the leads that they can choke on. But if they're not converting and they understand that conversion metric, they're just going through leads. And by the way, your biggest opportunity in this conversation is in what we call the chase, which is converting more business to business. You've already paid for the lead. Look, every law firm on earth, that's a big statement. This is a big earth, says to me, give me more leads. But evaluate what you're doing with those leads. Evaluate what you're doing with those calls. You know, nine out of 10 lawyers, when they come into their office, the very first thing they ask or the thing that they ask about intake is not how many calls we got, how many cases we signed up. Very, very few times does anybody say, how many calls did we get? And then the breakdown is how many calls did we get that were pertinent? How many calls are the wanted calls? And all of that, that all should be recognized before you say, well, how many cases did I sign up? Because if you're only looking at what I signed up, you're missing that whole spectrum of opportunity that's in front of you. If you're arrogant enough to say, I get whatever I want, or I get 94% of everybody I want, this conversation is not for you. Continue to do what you're doing. I'd rather educate your competitor. And that's how this, this business works. So Harlan, there's obviously several ways to grow a law firm. And one way is obviously just, you know, you bring in a ton of cases, but we've seen consistently in the more important metric, maybe even the most important is the value of the case, the average case value, because you could market and bring in a ton of leads and a ton of cases, but then, you know, of course, the introduces different challenges of having to maintain that, have the infrastructure to support it. The profit margin is lower. When you look at many of the seven, eight, nine figure firms, many of them are also bringing in the, the most significant cases too. They're asking for the most significant cases. In, in advertising, my mentor, Bill Meiskens, the executive creative director of J. Walter Thompson, when he adopted me into this business in 1975, he said to me, you get what you ask for. The backbone of my theory, the backbone that I have stuck to, uh, my strategy is you talk to the public the way you would a jury. When you talk to a jury, you're asking for a million dollars. You're asking for five million dollars. You're not asking for fifty five hundred dollars. That's how I believe that you advertise. You get what you ask for. Talk to the public the way you would a jury. Now, there's a lot of different techniques to do that. Churn and burn is not one of them. I'll give you an example. If you're a car wreck lawyer and you're asking for car wrecks, 
you're not asking for serious injuries. You're asking for volume. You're asking for car wrecks. Now, I have, you know, many, many friends that take in, you know, a thousand plus cases a month, you know, and you can do the math. A fee of $7,500 is the average fee. I mean, they, they've made millions and millions of dollars. I also have friends in the business and I have clients in the business that manage their business, their request and their advertising in a different way. And they only take in 400 cases or 300 or 200 cases a month. I know that sounds astronomical to most people, but the average value is 19, 20, 50,000. Who's making more money? Where's your profit margin? You get what you ask for. Let's say there's a firm, it's a smaller firm, whether it's you know less than five lawyers, for example, and they haven't been bringing in you know, the big cases. They're not bringing in six, seven, and eight figure cases. What are some of the ways you recommend that they can actually make some adjustments, make some pivots, even in their messaging to start attracting those cases? Because I don't want people to think that are listening that that can only go to the big advertisers, that they don't stand a chance because it's actually untrue. They, they do. They can actually, even these solos and small firms can bring in these, you know, these huge cases. But what are some of the ways you, you believe the messaging needs to change? in order to do that? Well, first of all, let's talk about who you're messaging. There's very few people on earth in the legal community that have booked more ad time than I have over the last 40 years. But I'm going to tell you unequivocally, in spite of the fact that we pioneered this industry in television advertising, the best case is coming in through referral. And you have to have a, a marketing program that sets you up to manage keeping in touch with your past clients, keeping in touch with people you haven't done business with. And truly, that's how you're going to get your best cases. Nobody is going to call you up if you're asking for a low-end rec case, you know, with a million-dollar case. I shouldn't say nobody. They do. But if you're a small firm and you're not, let's say, pumping out television dollars and you don't have a ardent television program or an advertising program, you're not spending tons of money on pay-per-click, foster your referral business. You will be amazed at what comes from word of mouth. It doesn't just happen, and it doesn't happen by just having a good outcome. It happens because you're continually marketing to those people. And the message has to be compassion, 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 not hounding somebody. I did a great job for you. Send me more business. It's keeping yourself in front of people in an intelligent and strategic way. What's the message? Thank you. I remembered your birthday. How was your family? You're a client for life. It's keeping in touch with people. That is a strategic maneuver that you can do to get great cases. With over 40 years of experience in the legal marketing space, Harlan has worked with hundreds of law firms and has seen how they function firsthand. I wanted to know what trends he's seen in the mindsets of the most successful law firm owners. How do they think and how do they operate differently than their competition? Some of the most uh, you know successful advertisers, you know the big fat cat sort of you know people, is they they get on a horse and they stay on the horse, and they're very very consistent. That is a very good thing. Advertising is won by consistency, and they pay attention to their advertising. They pay attention to their business. They pay attention. But one of the biggest mistakes that they they make is they don't move with the marketplace. They may be saying the same thing today as they did ten years ago or five years ago, and didn't adapt to a new mindset, didn't, didn't adapt to a new audience, didn't adapt to you know, a millennial culture. Because if you're trying to reach people today with the same message that you tried to reach with them 10 years ago, you're going to be successful, but your business is going to grow. It's not going to grow in the manner that it did 10 years ago. There's just too many outlets. You know, the thing that I see people, real winners embrace, is they, they're early adopters of technology, of social media, of, you know, early adopters on the internet, you know, got in, they understood it, they didn't have to play catch up. But that's only in relationship to how many people that are out there, Michael, a very few, because lawyers, they don't want to change. People don't know how to change. They don't know how to pivot. I don't know if I love that word or I, or I, or I can't stand it because it's being overused so much, but it does give you a good visualization. You pivot, you turn to go to a different direction. Early adoption is the most significant thing that you could embrace in this time to be a winner. And I see some firms do it and most firms don't. 
and in speaking of of pivoting, and I hope I don't offend in saying that we can use the word you know adapt or even even, even innovate. Perhaps you know one of the things that it might even be interesting because I'm sure a lot of people first learned about this podcast on social media. And there's a lot of attention on social media for any client. Their client is generally, I would say for the most part on social media, whether it's on Facebook, LinkedIn, or, you know, some other platform, but it seems like the, the, the legal industry as a whole, the majority of law firms are not, you know, advertising on social media. What, what do you think that resistance is? Well, they, they, they'd be getting bad advice. Number one, uh, they probably don't understand how to use social media or what social media is really about. And they're looking for a transactional approach and they're not going to get that. So they're, they're backing off of it. Social media, first of all, is new. It's only how many years old. We're all learning our way through it. You know, the first thing I can tell you about social media is that it's social. It's not transactional. You're not selling a widget. What you're selling is a personality and you're selling credibility as well as you're selling your culture or your brand. And so you have to really understand it. But social media is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It's completely controversial because now you have, you know, politicians tweeting and Facebook is saying, well, I don't like your tweet. So there's a lot of political unrest with it. But the truth of the matter is you have to understand it. And, and understand it is you have to do a lot of homework and listen to a number of really smart people and stupid people or people that are ignorant about it to kind of drill down. But if you're not embracing it and you're not learning and you're not an early adapter of it, you're just going to simply play catch up. I would agree. This is the standpoint that it is different. Perhaps you know, maybe there's even the aversion in some cases of the fact that, OK, I'm not getting, let's say, a direct lead the way I am on a Google pay-per-click where someone may be searching for, as an example, I don't know, like North Dakota personal injury lawyer. They're not doing that on Facebook, right? They're not there generally searching for an attorney. They're there engaging with, you know, with their friends, perhaps catching up on the news, whatever it is uh, that they're there for. But I guess this also kind of highlights the the aspect of certain investments that you may not be able to directly track, like there, you know, all sorts of branding, whether, you know, in some cases it's even um, billboards and so on that, we see many firm owners pass on or choose not to invest in because a dollar in doesn't always immediately represent a dollar fifty back. But what are your thoughts on investing in, you know, whether it's in mediums or even in types of advertising that you can't directly measure, but it seems like the <laughs> it's, it's kind of the, the path to building a great brand? Well, let me answer it this way. 15 and 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we'd spend a dollar and we'd get back 10. If I and the only thing we did was television, then we moved into the internet. Maybe we moved into you know billboards, or we were in billboards, or what have you. In this market, in this day and age, I can tell you. And now I've already qualified myself as placing a lot of media. I built one of the most premier pieces of intake and conversion software. It was in ninety six markets, you know, with the agency. I can unequivocally tell you that it is a it becoming less and less transactional, your tactics. If I could tell you exactly where somebody saw me, I wouldn't be on this podcast, Michael. I, and I'm adamant about tracking. The truth of the matter is, is that when you're doing multi-channel uh, marketing, which is, let's say, television, let's say, social media, let's say, P PPC, it is almost impossible to measure exactly where that client has come from. And that discourages people because they all want to know if I spend a dollar, I want back 10 or six or whatever the ratio is in your head. But it ain't happening anymore that way. It's just not happening that way. The worst question you could possibly ask in an intake is, how did you hear of us? Well, I saw you on radio and you're, you're, you're gathering this information, which is false. They may have, be on the Internet and they because something else drove them there. But if you're going to go into advertising and you only want an ROI on a dollar that you're spent, you are going to be a very disgruntled uh, advertiser. You're not going to be very, very happy. Uh, I see that, you know, on a lot of the uh, websites that I'm on, you know, the groups that I'm on. What should we do? Everybody's looking for that silver bullet. It doesn't exist anymore. It's diminished. You have to have a number of different channels influencing a person that needs a, needs a lawyer. Now, I just opened up with a whole new word, influence, because I believe that what's the biggest opportunity with social media is to influence your decision, to make a decision. That's a word that people in our business really rarely use, influence. 
We don't know what influencers are. Influencers, your generation. Am I saying it correctly? Yes, influencers. <laughs> yeah, you know, got kids that ride skateboards and people follow them because they ride skateboards and they like the shirt that the kid is wearing. By the way, look at the history of Dixon flannel wear in that business. Complete business, unbelievable, that was built on social media and influencers. You've got to understand that it, is, it will be becoming less transactional and more influential for people to make decisions. As we talk about the future, because I've, you know, I've got to ask you this, you've experienced a lot. You've seen the most successful firms. You've seen the least successful firms. So if you were to prognosticate, not only dictate where you believe the legal industry is going, but what firms will need to do not only to survive, but to succeed in the future of you know, the legal marketing landscape, what, what are some of those things? I think they have to practice good law and they have to add value and they have to really do what they signed on to do. Uh, I wouldn't take a client on unless they could retake, or re-acknowledge the oath of office that they took. It's only one paragraph. I'll do this, 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 and that. Because I think that a lot of lawyers have kind of got away from that with the marketing. It's a ticket to write, write your future. You can print money. I've heard all of those things. But I think the core business has to be, you have to be excellent lawyers and excellent people and treat people the way you want to be treated. And then uh, unless you market your practice, and you understand, you know, the digital aspect of it, I think you're sunk. Most people don't understand the digital. They're afraid of it. They don't know how to pick vendors. They don't know how to, what to do. But you, it's going to take a little, you know, a lot of bit of homework. I think you have to follow the way people consume information. And you have to take time to figure out how your client or how your prospective client is consuming information to go down that path. Now, you ask me, what's the, the state? What's going to happen? People don't do that. They, they call somebody up that has an agenda to buy something. It doesn't work. So they go to the next person. I think the industry is getting more and more crowded that way. There are more vendors that are out there than ever before. There's more options that are out there. I think you got to have a core value and you have to understand, OK, this is my client. How am I going to get into their head? We're getting back to, you know, talking to the public the way you would a jury. And I think that's where your survival will be. And Harwin, having been in the role in working with various vendors across numerous firms, I mean, you, you've been as, you know, essentially Switzerland. You know, but what would be some advice you would give to the firm owners listening on how to choose the right partners? Really, really just for anything, but just when they're, when they're investing in someone, working with someone, how do you pick the right ones? Don't hire somebody because your friend used them or you heard that they do a good job. Your business is unique. You're unique. And you have to find a resource. And I'd rather call them partners than vendors that you hook up with that have that have the same philosophy. You've got to ask a lot of questions. Take your time when you're shopping and looking. But I would eliminate vendors or partners that don't have the same culture. I'm on the fence with uh, virtual companies. I've been told that, you know, firms that have virtual employment, you know, people scattered all over the world because they're the most talented. I'm not so sold on that. I'm actually pretty turned off to it lately. And this pandemic has really confirmed a lot. You know, I like the camaraderie. I like the working as a team, the communication aspect, attacking problems as a group. You don't get that. I don't believe you get that when, you, when you're dealing with a virtual company. So Check out the bones of a company, ask questions, do a deep dive into resources. But you got to figure out, is, the, is their culture going to fit my culture? Ed Harlan is one of the, you know, I would say, most in tune, hardest working people that I've ever met. What are, what are some of the routines, that maybe even the habits that you have that allow you to stay on track? Because like, like you said earlier, and I don't know if we got the exclusive on this on the podcast, so you didn't retire, that you quit, but just essentially you are 24-7, 365. You're always working. You're always helping firms all across America. How do you manage Harlan? Well, first of all, I, I, I've never given up my passion, and my passion is, is as strong now as it, has it, as it ever been. I wake up in the morning, and I spend an hour to two hours on my own stuff. I get up you know, extra early so that I can have my private time, and I could see, number one, I have to manage my day. I have to put my day in order, but I take time to look at what is going on in the world. I take time. I see what's going on. You know, following this pandemic was interesting because you and I, we did a lot of podcasts. We did, people really relied on us, to, you know, for their opinions. And what I did, and I'll use that as an example, is that I paid attention. I paid attention to the trends of what's going on. 
you know, where are we in the, within this pandemic? And it changed kind of daily. And uh, I formulated, you know, my strategy based on the reality of the current situation. You know, it was kind of funny. We, when we first started out, we were all in panic. And then we, I watched the news. I watched what the news was saying. Now, I don't want to get into the political aspect of fake news or good news or bad news, but they definitely had a pattern. And watch the consumer. Watch where we're at. And, and then I fill in, well, how am I going to reach them that day? And that's how I formulate my strategy. You know, my job is to get from point A to point B quickly and profitably. And I got to know what the obstacles are in between. And that minefield is always changing. And so what Harlan does is he analyzes that minefield and figures out how many mines I got to step over to get to where I need to go on a daily basis. I actually run, that's my philosophy on advertising. And that's, that's how I tick. So Harlan, as, as we come to a close in this podcast, this being the game changing attorney podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? It's interesting because when I met you, you weren't talking about game changing and you, and you wanted to, and you adopted that game change and what it means to me and noticing you and other people, it means literally that changing the game, changing the way you're doing things, changing the way you're thinking or adapt new opportunities. I think game changing means understanding flexibility, having a strategy and doing the opposite of everybody else. That's how you change the game. I want to give a huge thank you to Harlan Schillinger for taking the time to speak with us today. You know, what particularly resonated for me was when Harlan mentioned that some of the greatest growth happens during the toughest times and the opportunities that not only just times of uncertainty like COVID-19, but also the future crises that lay before us present for not only making market leaps, but improving our firms from within. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with me, Michael Mogul. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast with at least one other ambitious law firm owner who you believe would benefit. And you know what? Maybe more than one. For more information on our interview with Harlan Schillinger, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit GameChangingAttorney.com. And join us next time when we'll be talking to renowned San Diego trial attorney John Gomez about the importance of maintaining discipline in both business and in life. Hardships are what shape champions. And so if you haven't been through hardship, how are you going to learn to answer the bell when times get tough? Could it happen? I imagine it could, you know, like your father runs a great law firm and then he just gives it to you and the firm is already a click in and you make it even better. I suppose that could happen. But the more enduring stories are born of some struggles along the way. That's next time on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast.